Hello everyone, my name is Trayvon Burkhead and for today's video we will be discussing a global analysis of the impacts of urbanization on biodiversity. Now I have chosen this topic because of how applicable it is to our everyday life. So we ourselves, when I say we, us humans, uh, are the cause of urbanization and we can also reap the benefits of urbanization, okay? Uh, we see these benefits such as housing, uh, roads, stores, cities, etc. So anything that you do to your everyday life uh, is usually it comes from urbanization or it's a cause of urbanization. Now, although we receive these benefits from urbanization, there are also many negative effects that take place, such as the damage it can do to our environment and the biodiversity of an area. So before we go any further, uh, I'd like to just outline uh, what we'll be going over today. So first we will start with uh, introducing urbanization and its effects on biodiversity and the ecosystem. Next, we will go over the study and the goal of the study. After that, uh, we'll go over the approach and the methods, followed by the results and conclusion. Then I have a few take home points for you all. So a little bit of background information, okay? What exactly is urbanization? So urbanization is the process of making the area more urban. Urban areas house the majority of the world's, world's population, and there has been a certain interest in researching urban ecosystems. For many, urban areas are sometimes viewed as concrete jungles. Uh, I know we've all heard about New York. That's a, that's a pretty good picture to have right there. But uh, these urban areas are viewed as concrete jungles with multiple organisms dominated by non-natives and homogeneous taxa across each region. So I have a few uh, important vocabulary words that you can see in the parentheses, uh, starting with urban sprawl, impervious surface, green space, anthropogenic factors, and more. All right, so we'll start with urban sprawl. Uh, urban sprawl is exactly what it sounds like, okay? It is the expansion of urban areas, okay? So uh, we'll take Atlanta, for instance, okay? So we have the metro area, which is right inside of 285, and then we have, you know, all of these different cities. So let's say, like, you have Marietta, um, yeah, Gwinnett is in the city, it's a county, but you know, we have all these different cities on the outside of the metro area, and that itself is urban sprawls. It's when, it's when these urban areas are starting to expand from the inner city, okay? Uh, next we'll go over is, the next vocab word we'll go over is impervious surface. So impervious surface means those surfaces uh, in which do not absorb water, okay? They are not permeable. They consist of all buildings, parking areas, driveways, roads, sidewalks, and almost any area of concrete or asphalt. So basically anything that has a surface that will not allow the infiltration of water to occur is going to be classified as an impervious surface. Next, we'll go over green spaces. Uh, this is a very important vocab word. Uh, you'll hear green space a lot through this presentation. So green spaces are an area of grass, trees, or other vegetation uh, which is set apart for recreational, aesthetic, or environmental purposes in an otherwise urban area. Uh, for example, uh, any of my Georgia natives, we have Piedmont Park, which is probably one of the biggest parks in Georgia. That is one of our urban green spaces. Um, yeah. Lastly, the last vocab word we'll go over is going to be anthropogenic factors. Uh, anthropogenic factors constitute the primary causes of species declines, okay? Uh, the endangerment and extinction of those species also. Uh, this happens through land development, over exploitation, species translocations and or introductions and also pollution. Um, you cannot tell all of these factors uh, do involve human involvement or you know, they only come because humans are involved. So some of the questions that you should kind of ponder while we're going through this PowerPoint are, why should we care, right? What importance does this serve to me? Uh, should we stop this? You know, that, that kind of goes hand in hand. Why, do we, why should we care? But you know, should we stop this uh, trend of urbanization from continuing? And then is urbanization even completely bad for the ecosystem and or biodiversity? So all great questions to ponder while we go through this. Uh, PowerPoint, and you might be surprised by some of the information that we find. And last but not least, for the background information, some of the major themes that you'll be seeing throughout the PowerPoint. 
starting with the development of cities and the inclusion of green spaces. Uh, then we have biodiversity of a given region. And lastly, the conservation of nature. Here is a graphic for you uh, for impervious surface. So all of the impervious surface will be here in the yellow, which is usually going to be made of concrete or anything that is not permeable. And all of the green is going to be pervious surface, which is going to be our regular green spaces, our land that water can um, you know, go through. And this bottom picture right here is just a green space similar to Piedmont Park. So on to the study and uh, the reasons for the study. So the name of this study is a global analysis of the impacts of urbanization on bird and plant diversity re reveals key anthropolo anthropogenic drivers. So the reasons for this study, okay. Over half of humanity now lives in cities, uh, which cover less than 3% of the Earth's terrestrial surface. Uh, cities are often located in naturally species rich regions where native species are threatened by an array of anthropogenic factors, including habitat loss and species introductions that present serious conservation challenges. Now, cities are novel ecosystems. Uh, they are characterized by fragmented and disturbed environments with high densities of fabricated structures and impervious surfaces with strong heat retaining abilities. Uh, and these elevated levels, and they will have elevated levels of resources for these species rich regions. In particular, the invasions of exotic species out into human medicated or mediated biotic interchange and ex extinctions of indigenous native species out into habitat alteration and destruction may lead to a gradual replacement of native biotas by locally expanding non-native across the world's cities. So basically we'll have exotic animals coming in and taking over for the non-exotic or for the native species, uh, which is not something that we perfectly want, okay? So the goal of this study, the goal of this study is as urbanization continues to expand, efforts directed towards the conservation of intact vegetation with urban landscapes could support higher concentrations of both bird and plant species. Despite the declines in density of species, cities still retain endemic native species, thus providing opportunities for regional and global biodiversity, cons biodiversity cons conservation, restoration, and education. So we really just want, what they want with this paper is, it, it's, it's a descriptive paper, okay? They really want us to gain some knowledge so that we can go forward and even possibly, you know, change some policy that that is surrounding these this urbanization and urban development. So a quick introduction of the study. Um, they decided to examine the status of bird and plant diversity in the world's cities, homo homogenization of biota and the density of species relative to estimates of non urban levels and the anthropogenic and environmental correlates of density of species in a city. Now, the density of bird and plant species has declined substantially. Uh, currently, we only have 8% of native and 25% of native or native bird species and 25% of native plant species are currently compared with the estimates of non-urban density of species. The current density of species in cities and the loss of density of species was best explained by the anthropogenic factors such as land cover, city age, uh, rather than the non-anthropogenic factors such as geography, climate, and topography. So the approach of this study uh, was a bit different, right? This is a descriptive study. So there was not a true hypothesis that they tested. It was more so they gathered a bunch of surveys and wanted to see what the trends were. Okay, so to facilitate the global scale comparative studies of urban biodiversity and analyze the global consequences of urbanization on biodiversity, they compiled urban bird species lists for 54 cities and citywide floors of spontaneously established vascular plants for 110 cities. Okay, so 54 cities for our birds and 110 cities for our plants. The list encompasses 36 countries on six different continents and six different biographic realms. Uh, we'll see these bio biographic realms in the next slide uh, when we get to our methods. Uh, they'll have six different realms. Uh, each one has their own different kind of climate and environment. Uh, 
So yeah, this study also has a high level of importance because it is one of the few studies that looks at the global effects of urbanization instead of looking at a single city or region. This study is also important to note that this study represents the current largest global compilation of urban diversity or urban biodiversity to date. So, okay, so next we will go over our methods. So they have three steps into their methodology. So first one being a biological data. So biological data consisted of a city list of birds and plants that were obtained from literature, databases, and expert surveys. Plant lists included surveys of natural and spontaneous vegetation collected since the 1950s. The bird list included all species recorded during surveys conducted since the 1990s that used standardized methods. Data sets were complete lists uh, within the administrative boundary of a city. Uh, so not, so we're talking about Atlanta, Georgia, right? We're gonna talk about more so the metro area and maybe not North Georgia or South Georgia that's closer to the, uh, the Carolina or Tennessee line or the Florida, Alabama line. We're looking at more so the metro area where everything's gonna be more urban. Vagrant and accidental bird species were excluded by experts from each region and each species was assigned as being exotic or native to each city using a bird life international range map. Plant species were designated native or exotic also to each city after consulting the literature and experts from each region. Uh, that's going to be very important when we get to our graphs because they wanted to compare uh, how the native species were doing in their urban areas compared to the exotic or invasive species that are coming in because of you know, the exotic plants that attract these new animals. So for uh, method B, which is the patterns of urban diversity. So this is the part of my biostatistics guys, uh, where we get into the t-test and our parity test and everything. Uh, so they use several, several different metrics to examine the structure and composition of urban bird and plant communities uh, for all cities combined and by biographic realm. They examine the representation of urban biotas within the world's biota using the Bird Life International Taxonomic Checklist and a global list of vascular plant families with estimates of species richness compiled from multiple sources. Now, this helps examine comp compositional similarity among cities using a hierarchical cluster analysis. Now, the clustering method that was used calculated unweighted pair groups and arithmetic averages, um, and they identified the most prominent clusters using an adaptive branch pruning technique, okay? All, of, all analysis were conducted in the statistical package um, for my stat guys. The software is RB2.15.2. Uh, the hierarchical cluster analysis was conducted using the H plus function in the stats library of the cluster identification using the dynamic tree cut library. Basically just saying uh, they ran a bunch of tests to put these clusters together and understand how the non-native species compare to the native species. So for point C, the predictors of urban diversity. Uh, so they considered 13 different predictors of the density of bird and plant species and change in densities of bird and plant species from non-urban levels. Uh, land, cover, land cover was expected to be an important predictor of the density of species as it defines the quantity and quality of suitable habitats within the city. The land cover variables and all non-anthropogenic variables were estimated within a 15 kilometer, kilometer radius of the circle city center. Uh, so we'll go back to our Atlanta analogy. We have the metro area, we're talking about 15 kilometers out, we'll say as far as Marietta maybe. So everything is going to be with, within those bounds. Uh, they log transformed the four density estimates and eight predictor variables to improve the distribution of properties. Uh, they also evaluated variables for multi-culinary and singularity use of variance inflation factors where variables with the VIF5 indicated from concern. So before we go into, actually we can go ahead and go into our next one. So here is just kind of a map of the cities that were used and surveyed in this study. Um, as you can see here, there were a total of 147 cities used. And as our map shows, all of the cities in red were just going to be for birds. All the cities in blue were for our basket of plants and the cities in black would be both uh, plants and birds that were surveyed. So 
So here is figure one, okay? So out of the 147 cities considered in the analysis uh, and species richness of basket root plants, the box block show the distribution of species richness for exotic and native species across all cities combined and for the four, four and for the six biogeographical bi realms. So here we see uh, we have E for exotic, and this one is plants. So E for exotic plants and N for our native species. As we can see, so richness, richness in this case is going to be describing how many species are present in that ecosystem. And later on, after we get to the results, density is going to refer to the population of each species in its own right. But as far as richness, we're just going to talk about how much species is present in each ecosystem. So as we see, for the most part, uh, the exotic species aren't going to be as present as the native species in plants. We see the same trend for our birds as well. And then again, this is not our results. This is just the first part of our methods where the, they got the data from the surveys. So into our results. Uh, so exotic species uh, are an increasing threat to our global biodiversity. Uh, exotic species are considered to be yeah, an increasing threat to our global biodiversity. The number of exotic species differs broadly from the city, from among cities with a median of 3.5 exotic birds due to, due to the reduction of green spaces and land cover. The relative proportion of exotic plant species is much greater to that of exotic bird species. Cities contain a median of 28% of, of exotic plants and 3% of exotic birds. These differences suggest that urban bird and plant communities are assembled under different processes. Uh, to dive a little deeper, not into this study, but we will get to our reference page a little bit later. There's another study that cites that part of the reason that our plant species, uh, the, the percentage is so much higher for the exotic number is because we're introducing these exotic plant species ourselves, right? So in these green spaces, we're bringing in non-native species because people like to plant for aesthetic instead of for an environmental purpose. Anthrop anthropogenic factors have played a big role in the decrease of richness and species of an area. So in our cities, we found about 36 birds and 65 plants identified by the IUCN Global Red List as threatened with extinction. Uh, threatened bird species occur in 14 cities, which is about 30% of all surveyed cities, uh, with Singapore having the greatest number. Uh, threatened plant species are found in a much smaller proportion of the cities, only 8% compared to the 30% for birds, uh, with the greatest number found in Singapore and in Hong Kong. Among the realms, the greatest number of threatened bird and plant species together are found in the Indo-Malaya area, whereas the Nearctic has the fewest threatened bird species and the Palearctic has the fewest threatened plant species. So clearly, a uh, human-mediated global biotic interchange has played, excuse me, a considerable role in the development of urban plant communities. Like we said, you know, people are bringing in plants for aesthetic as opposed for what's better for that realm or that, that environment. So although our, the analysis thus far, positive indicators of the ability of cities to support diverse biotas, uh, we found an extensive decrease in the density of species for each cities when compared to the estimates of non-urban density of a species. A median of 8% of non-urban density bird species is currently found in these cities. It's different among realms. And we will actually see this in the next slide. So here we have density, right? So it's gonna be different from this, this figure two and figure one is figure one went over richness, which is going to be how many different species are in the area. Now we're going over density of bird and plant species. So we're looking at the population numbers. So here we have N for native and A for native plus exotic, right? So for our native plant species, you see the density here. Uh, our native species is going, the trend here is that the native species is going to be a little bit lower than the native plus exotic. Uh, the only reason for this is because, because the exotic is added to the native, we'll see a higher number. Uh, like we said before, I believe 28% of exotic plant species are been added to the native species number. Uh, 
Uh, also, as we can see, the trend is pretty similar for every realm. Uh, the only realm that is shortly off is going to be these two here. That's only going to be for our plant species, OK? So now on to our conclusion and discussion. So as expected, uh, the characteristics of the city primarily determine the loss and density of the bird and native plant species. Uh, urban floor is incorrectly clustered primarily in those in Australasia, which may be explained by the high proportion of exotic species from other regions in those cities. Also, urbanization does not completely hurt biodiversity, but it will lower the density of an organism. And lastly, the size and placement of green spaces is very important in terms of what biodiversity will look like. Uh, another point to add to this slide, uh, we talked about the aesthetic of bringing in non-native plant species. Well, that does hurt our environment because it, it interferes with our native plant species and they start to compete. Once they start to compete, we also have other non-native species of birds and insects that come in because of these non-native plants. So it's a cause and effect pattern here. A couple take home points, uh, the, species, the species density and the overall diversity in the city rely on the size, quantity and quality of urban green spaces. So if we had more urban green spaces uh, closer together, we might see a, you know, an uptake in our biodiversity and an uptake in the density of our bird and plant species or our native bird and plant species in an area. This also, this paper gives us the opportunity to, you know, it provides us the knowledge in order to change and upgrade policy, okay? Basically the future is in our hands. Um, this is a very important topic as you know, we will be continuing to live on this planet for you know, as long as we are here. Uh, it's very important that we continue to try to make our environment better for ourselves and those who will come after us. Here are my sources. Uh, this is my main source, which is what we went over for the majority of the PowerPoint. These sources right here uh, help me with my background information on urbanization. All right, thank you for your time. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the end of your semester.